We would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Russ Benedict, and he's studied bats for more than 30 years all over the world and has been a professor at Central College for 17 years. Please give him a warm welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Is the microphone working okay? Okay, I also talk really loud, so I don't, don't even really need a microphone, but, but that's okay. So, so, um, so again, I've been working as a professor of biology at Central now for about 17 years. Um, and um, I fell in love with bats, um, actually in, it was love at first sight in a sense. Um, so I, was, uh, I was, had just started work on my master's degree and um, it was taking a class called Natural History of Nebraska Mammals. Um, and one of the assignments as part of the class was to go with the professor and catch bats one night. Um, I don't know what I was doing, but I didn't want to go. You know, I had something really important to do, like watch football on TV or something dumb like that. Um, you, know, you know, college students sometimes make pretty dumb decisions. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, so I went because I was forced to. Um, and within about two hours, I knew it was something I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, and there's something, and this, I invite each and every one of you to come out with me and catch bats and see them out in the woods um, and see them face to face in a controlled kind of a setting where it's not scary. It's not three o'clock in the morning and they're flying around your house and you're terrified of them. Um, it's, it's a more controlled setting because you'll see that they have charisma that you can't, can't imagine. Um, they're just amazing little critters and there's this whole element of magic to them. They're so hard to see when you're outside you, you can't even imagine that they're there. One of my favorite things to do is, um, in the old days I had this bat detector. I have a new bat, bat detector now, but the old one had headphones. Um, and so I'd go out in the woods and I'd be standing next to a creek um, and I'd be, have the bat detector going with the headphones on and every once in a while it just sounded like, the, the bat detector would sound like a machine gun, just this constant bat noise up and down this creek. And then you'd take the headphones out and it was just complete silence. So in other words, this, there was this whole world going on right in front of you, but with my poor human senses, I couldn't even tell it was there. Um, so I've always been intrigued by kind of the magic of the whole thing. Uh, and so I'm just going to warn you at the end of this, because I, I think I've got, what, four hours? Is that right? Three hours, <laughs> and then an hour-long test. So be ready for that. Uh, but at the end of this, you may want to be a bat biologist. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, um, Central College, so Central College is, um, I, I interviewed there, so here's a little bit of sales pitch. I interviewed there, um, and 10 minutes into my interview, I was like, this is it. If they, if they offer me the job, I'm, I'm coming here. Um, it's just a beautiful place. Um, about 1,200 kids, um, all undergraduate, so I have no graduate students. Um, and, uh, and my teaching load is pretty high, which is pretty typical of a small school. So I teach a lot of classes per semester. What that means is the only way I can really get research done is to get students involved. Um, and I 100% understand that my research is 50 to 75% education first. Um, the, the main reason I do a lot of this is, is to get students involved, and, and it's a blast. Um, if you ever want to just feel really good, hang out with a bunch of young kids and watch them get fired up about a topic and, and, and watch them go and watch where they go, and it's kind of just a, it's an amazing job. Okay, so um, I don't like to just tell you things. I like to quiz you. All right, so here comes a little bit of quizzing time, okay? So bats are the only mammal that is capable of true flight, okay? What's the difference between true flight and gliding? And by the way, you don't have to raise your hands, just yell out answers. They have to flap. They have to flap. In order to be a true flyer, you must flap. And because you can flap your wings, that allows you to do what? Now actually, here, hold on, hold on. Yeah, I, I was going to say, just do this with, with um, body language. That allows you to do what? Allows you to go up. Okay, if you're a glider, you're just going to always go down. Um, but bats are the only mammals that are capable of true flight. Um, two other major groups um, of vertebrates, animals with backbones, are also capable of true flight. Um, one of them is birds. There, I took the easy one. Who's the other one? Squirrels. No, so, so, squirrels are actually gliders, yeah. I'll give you a little hint, because nobody ever gets it. They're no longer alive. They're all extinct. Ter pterosaurs, yeah, the pterosaurs, there were actually at one point in time many species of pterosaurs, and they were also capable of true flight. Um, okay, now, how many, if we go around the world, how many different species of bats are there? Over a thousand is guess number one. Anybody want to get try another guess? Higher than a thousand, lower than a thousand? Higher. Okay, a little bit, a little bit. Um, whoops, just a second here. 1,200 is our number. 
Um, so about 1,200 species of bats. Now, one of the things you always want to know, and, and this is true of every group of organisms out there, and that is our knowledge is very imperfect. So when you hear a number like 1,200, don't sink that in your head as the actual number. We don't really know what the number is. Um, in many cases, what happens is, um, okay, here is species A. It's got this geographic distribution, and so that's what we think is species A. Somebody gets in and looks in real detail and actually finds out that species A is, in fact, three different species. They look really similar to our eyes. We can't tell them apart, but the bats can. All right, and so that happens quite a bit. Um, or other case times, the opposite will happen. We think these are two separate species, but then we do more closer studies and we realize, no, actually they're the same species. So, so numbers are always kind of a guess when it comes to, comes to critters. But notice that over 20% of all mammals are bats. If you have bats and rodents together, you've got about 70% of all mammals. So those are the two giant groups in the, in the mammal world. Okay, so 1,200 species worldwide, how many in Iowa? Nine, I heard the number three times. So either you're all right or somebody gave you false information. Um, in this case, you are all right. <laughs> okay, so we've got nine regular residents and then another two species that just pop into the state from time to time. The two rare visitors are both high flyers. They're, they're long distance flyers that can cover 500 miles in a night. Um, their breeding populations are down to our south, and once the breeding um, is done at the end of the summer, they just wander. So late summer, you'll, you'll see them around. Um, okay, let's see. Next question. This one you're not going to get. Who among living mammals, who is the closest relative of bats? Rodents. Many people say that bats are just mice with wings. Wrong. Okay, not, in fact, not even related at all. I mean, they're mammals, so they're related in that sense. But other than that, they're not related to rodents. But it's a mammal that lives around here and is about the same size as many mice. Shrews, yeah. So shrews are actually very closely related to bats. Um, as it turns out, bats and shrews are more closely related to us than they are to rodents. So you could even be more accurate by saying that bats are actually little flying people um, than saying bats are, are flying rodents. <laughs> okay, by the way, just a quick little, quick little plug here for my friends. Um, I've also done quite a bit of research on shrews too. Um, don't start studying about them either because they have such cool biology that you'll want to be a shrew biologist too. Um, by the way, so locally we have the northern short-tailed shrew. Um, what is distinctive about the northern short-tailed shrew? one of the world's only blank mammals. Venomous, venomous, they're a venomous mammal, interesting. The venom is strong enough that if you have a small dog or cat, and if that small dog or cat is really sick or is really right at the end of their life, then a shrew might end that, that animal's life. Um, for a healthy dog or cat, it won't do anything to them, but, but, but that's pretty strong venom. Okay, so there's shrews. All right, now, um, worldwide, bats are small. The biggest bat lives. <laughs> Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian Peninsula. And then I think they do occasionally show up down in Australia as well. It's one of the flying foxes. Flying foxes are just one of the subgroups of bats. Um, so one of those guys has a wingspan of between five and six feet. But, but that bat only weighs two pounds. All right, so it's basically picture a fox squirrel, the, the really common reddish brown squirrel in your yard, stick some great big wings on it and you've got, a, you've got the biggest bat on earth, okay? Um, the average bat here in Iowa weighs about as much as a nickel. Um, the small species of bats in Iowa, which are this size, this isn't actually one of them, but are this size, are down at about the weight of a dime or so. Um, so bats are small, but despite being small, they have major impacts um, huge impacts on ecosystems. You remove them from ecosystems and the ecosystems change. Three big impacts that bats have. Those three impacts are eat insects, so major predator of night flying insects. Pollination, major pollinators. We don't really know how many plants. Um, the guesses are in the New World tropics, so Central and South America, probably at least 20% of plants are pollinated primarily by bats. It may be higher than that. Okay, so that's two. Insects, pollination. Fertilization. For, well, pollinza pollination is, is essentially fertilization in a sense. Not exactly the same, but close enough. 
I'm still missing one. She just told you the answer, didn't she? She just told me. Oh, okay. It is, it is seed dispersal. Um, and by the way, Jesse up here is cheating. She's giving answers to her friend. <laughs> But yeah, the third big, third big thing they do is to, to disperse seeds. There's a lot of bats that are fruit eaters, um, and they either spit the seeds out or they poop them out. Um, but one way or another, especially down in the tropics, one of the major things that, that research in Africa has shown is if you clear a rainforest, if that rainforest still has rainforest around it, then, and then if you measure the trees that are brought in over the course of that first 50 years, about 80% of those are actually being brought in by bats. So really important dispersers of, of fruits. Okay, so there we go, major predators of insects, important pollinators, and vital seed dispersers in the tropics. Okay, so now, I like this picture, because that really gives you a sense for, for the design of a bat. Okay, and I always think of the design as, um, let's see, do we have, okay, we've got a couple of young ones, so I have to watch my language a little bit here. Um, the Terminator. That movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, The Terminator. There's one stage right at the very beginning of The Terminator. Uh, the, uh, so Terminator's Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the days when he was a bodybuilder, not a governor. Um, and there's one stage right in the very beginning where you see Arnold from behind with no clothes on. Um, and his rear end is about that big around, across, but his upper body is just giant. Um, so so that's, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> okay, so, so now picture this. Um, so I weigh, I don't know, uh, more than 200 pounds. Um, imagine if 30 to 40% of my body weight was in chest muscles and a little bit in back muscles. I would end up having, if you, my actual weight's about 260, so I'd, I'd be having like 80 pounds, roughly, of muscle in my chest and my back. Um, so that's the way they're built. Roughly 30 to 40% of their total body weight is chest and back muscles to power those wings. So you can see just that enormous upper body. Um, but then for one reason or another, bats have these tiny little hips um, and really wimpy little leg muscles. One of the interesting aspects about their knees, or about their legs, is um, I, I should have one of you stand up and demonstrate this. I'll, I'll explain it first and see if anybody can stand up and demonstrate this. Um, what bats have done is they have spun their, their legs around 180 degrees. So when they bend their knees, instead of the knees coming this way, the knees actually bend the opposite direction. But if you think about it, if you're a bat laying on the ground, Knowing that you don't have much leg muscles, you can't really lift yourself up off the ground very well. If you're going to try and move your knees, your knees are going to bang into the ground underneath you. So they solved that by rotating the, the legs around 180 degrees. Um, so they now point the opposite direction. Okay? But the, the real star of the show here is wings. Okay? So how did they build their wings? And basically what they did was to elongate their hands and then spread real thin skin across all the fingers and then wrapping down to the feet and then across to the tail, and then up the other side, okay? So there we go, there's our thin sheet of skin. Um, it's, it's tougher than you might imagine, based on this picture. Um, it's fairly elastic, so you can push on it pretty good. Um, I have never felt as if I'm gonna push my finger right through there. I mean, it's, it's elastic enough and strong enough that, that you don't feel that. Um, you'll notice that you, they do get holes popped in there. Um, thorns or arguments with other bats, that kind of stuff, will give them little holes. Um, and they will bleed out of their wing if you, if you cut one. Um, but notice that here are scars, so they can, in fact, heal up cuts, and they heal them up pretty fast. Okay? Um, you'll also notice out here, so big blood vessels, so the skin is alive. Um, and how about these, these parallel ribbons here? There's a bunch here, a bunch more here, a bunch there. What are those? Fingerprints. Good thought. Not fingerprints, though. They're tendons and muscles. Um, so those are little fibers of muscle and tendon going across there. So in other words, they have a lot of control over the shape of their wing. And they can control the right wing independent of the left wing. Okay, so if you're flying along and you cup the right wing slightly more than you cup the left wing, what are you going to do? You're going to turn. Right, so they can actually, they can use the tail membrane here as a rudder to turn, but they can also just hold the two different wings in different positions or flap them slightly different to turn as well. Now the other cool aspect of the tail membrane here is they can roll that up kind of like a window screen rolls up. Um, so as it turns out, our local insect eating uh, bats, most of the insects are caught with the tail membrane. They, they roll it into a scoop. Sometimes they will knock the insect down with a wing. They'll bat the insect down. Um, and then they'll scoop it up with the tail membrane and they can roll the tail membrane up to hold the insect inside there. Okay, but now here's the cool thing. Okay, so let's see how well you do with your anatomy. 
Okay, hold your arm up like this. No, no, don't punch in each other. Um, go like this. Okay, got it? Excellent. What bone is that? Humerus. Humerus. These two right here are? Radius and ulna. Okay. Bones of your wrist? Carpals. Tarsals in your ankles. Carpals. Bones of the palm of the hand? Metacarpals. Now fingers are phalanges. Good. Okay. Okay. So, so, I mean, it's probably, for many of you, probably been a year or two maybe since you've had that, so, so good. Okay, but now look at the dimensions here. So, there's the humerus. So, pretty standard sized humerus for a mammal. Okay, if you were the same size as a bat, you'd probably have a humerus that maybe is just a touch longer than that. But now look at the radius and the ulna. There's the radius and the ulna. Two, two and a half times longer than the, than the humerus. Look at you. You're about equal. Okay, so they've elongated the radius and the ulna. Here's the hand. All of the bones, the, the carpals and the metacarpals have kind of been jammed together, so it's kind of hard to see them, but that's the hand. What's that little doohickey standing up there? That's the thumb, and they have a claw on it, so they can use that claw to crawl. Okay, but now, so here are the fingers. So there's the pinky. Look at the pinky in relation to the, to the radius and the ulna. The pinky's longer than the radius and the ulna are, but the longest finger of all is the middle finger. Starts here, comes out, and it actually ends somewhere right about the edge of the screen out here. So notice that the middle finger is like two, two and a half times longer than the radius and the ulna. Okay? Think about that the next time you're stuck in traffic and somebody's behind you honking. Just imagine if you were a bat. <laughs> okay. So super long fingers. Long radius and all, and then that, that cool, thin sheet of, of skin that connects everything to each other. Okay, questions on that design? No, they, there are five. Um, the, the, the index finger is kind of hard to see. Um, the index finger is just a little splint that runs right along there, and it basically stops right about here. So the index finger is very short relative to the, to the middle finger. Now, the other group of bats, the flying foxes, they're actually in their own suborder, so a subgroup different from this group, and they actually have two fingers that stick up, so their index finger sticks slightly up above the wing, and it also has a claw on it. Um, so there's a little bit of differences in design depending upon which group we're talking about. Okay, so here then is some variation, because if you go around the world and catch different bats, you see different designs, um, and those different designs always have a purpose to them. Okay, so take a look at the dude in the lower left. What's the first thing you notice about the dude in the lower left? Well, his tongue stuck out. But what about his tail membrane? He doesn't have one. So what the heck do you think that's telling you? It's probably not catching insects, since all the insect eaters have great big, great big tail membranes. So what's he eating then? Could be fruit, but... What would you want if you were a nectar and pollen feeder in terms of the length of your tongue? You would want a long tongue to be able to stick the tongue far down into the flower. This guy's tongue is so long he can't even pull it all the way back into his mouth. And on top of that, it's a little hard to tell from this angle, but his snout is quite long also. So they hover in front of flowers, put the snout in, and then stick the tongue way down in to get to the nectar down at the bottom. So that's a little nectar feeder. This is a tiny little dude from down in, in Costa Rica, one of those bats that, that weighs about as much as a, as a penny. There's about five different species in this same related group, um, and you basically need genetics to tell them apart. They're really hard to, to distinguish from each other. Now, these other two pictures are really designed for wing shape. So notice on the top, we've got short, broad wings. Um, on the bottom, it's a little hard to see because he doesn't have his wings fanned quite right, but those wings are long and very skinny. Okay? We see that same pairing in birds, too. Birds often have one design or the other. Um, there's a few that are somewhere in between, but often one or the other. What's the beauty of short, round wings? Maneuverability. Super maneuverability. In this guy's case, unbelievable maneuverability. This guy flies so low, or so slow, that the aeronautics folks have tried to look at it and figure out, how's it staying in the air? It's going so slow, it shouldn't be able to do that. It maneuvers in and among the, the branches of trees, it's echolocating so it doesn't hit leaves and branches, and it's listening for the sounds of caterpillars walking and chewing. And then it finds the caterpillars, yanks them off, and it's mostly a caterpillar eater. But if you're going to hover and fly really slow in and among branches, you have to have short, broad wings. This guy, on the other hand, this is the Mexican free-tailed bat. 
Um, how many of you have seen Watch the Bats Come Out of Carlsbad Caverns? Okay, a couple of you have. Anybody been to the big bridge in Austin, Texas, where they have lots of bats? So those are both the same species, Mexican free-tailed bats. Uh, a free-tailed bat will cover 100, sometimes 200 miles in a night. They're high flyers. They chase these big, widespread clouds of insects that are up at 1,000 feet up in the air. There's a bunch of these insects that get way up high and they migrate north. A lot of them are actually agricultural pests. Um, so that's what these guys are up and pounding. Um, if you're up 1,000 feet up off the air, you don't really have to worry about being maneuverable. There's not too many tree branches up there to avoid. Okay? Instead, you want to be able to cover long distances at kind of a good moderate speed, but be really energy efficient. So that's what long skinny wings are for. Um, long distance flight, um, very energy efficient. These guys are not maneuverable. Um, we would catch them, we've caught them at, at Carlsbad Caverns, about a mile down below the caverns. The caverns actually sit up on top of a mountain. It's kind of a low mountain. Um, but down below that, there's a big natural spring area. And so we go down there and we string up nets um, and we try and catch the bats as they're flying. Um, and as the free-tailed bats approach you, you'll see them at like 20 or 30 feet away from the net. You can tell all of a sudden, oh, they're changing direction because they've detected that the net is there, but they're just so unmaneuverable, they still crash right into your nets anyways. On the other hand, this guy flies slow up to the net, hovers in front of the net, then slowly turns around and goes back the other direction. <laughs> Every once in a while, once a night, twice a night, you'll get lucky and you'll be checking, using your flashlight and you'll see one doing this. And when that happens, I yell at whichever student is close, chase it. And you can literally chase them and chase them into the net. Um, so that's how you catch big-eared bats. <clears throat> okay, so there's cool variations on a theme. Now, um, one, of the things, one of the things that people tell me a lot is, yeah, but they're so ugly. How can you like them? Um, well, there's lots of things in biology that are ugly, lots of things in, that are in, in nature that are ugly. But if you understand why they're ugly, then they become beautiful. So, so it, it's really all up to us then. So it's your job to understand why they look the way they do. So here's our, our big-eared bat again. Um, so incredible ears. Um, so again, keep in mind that it's both echolocating for leaves and branches, but also listening for super faint sounds. So you just have to have incredible so, uh, uh, solar or sonar collectors to be able to do that. You have to have huge ears. By the way, these slivers of skin that stick up into the ears, those are, that's what's called the tragus. You have, if you feel the front edge of your ear, you have a little knob sticking up. That's our anti-tragus. Their tragus starts at the back of the ear and comes up. Ours starts at the front of the ear and, and comes up. So we have an anti-tragus. They have a tragus. The thought is with the tragus that with their echolocating, they hold the right tragus in a little bit different position than the left. So the right ear gets a slightly different reading on a sound than the left ear, and that allows them to triangulate on, on things a little bit better. Okay, now this next bat, I have to give you a little story here. Um, so the old lady, um, and, and by the way, my wife is one and a half years older than me, so it's perfectly legal for me to call her the old lady. Um, she is really good at, at getting bats out of nets. Um, getting bats out of a mist net is kind of an art form. Um, it takes a good 7,500 bats or so till you're, till you're really good at this. Um, but my wife is really good at it. Um, as it turns out, my older daughter is also very good at this too. Um, she's sitting right back there. Um, she's, she's one of the faster bat netters I've, I've ever seen. Um, sometimes you have to kind of keep her moving a little bit because she'll like to take naps and that kind of stuff. By the way, as soon as, as soon as I heard that my older daughter was going to be here, I was like, yes, I've got somebody to harass in the crowd. <laughs> if she hadn't been here, then Mark Rasmussen here, he took classes with me in the past, I'd be harassing him right and left. So he's lucky that she's here. <laughs> okay, so at any rate, my... My wife is over there working on a net, and she's pulling a bat out of the, out of the net, and I'm here working on, an, on a bat. And I hear her say, Russ, I don't know what this is. It's a bat I've never seen before, um, and it's really weird looking. Um, then she gives me a couple of descriptors of it, and I start to get in my head, huh, there's a bat I've always wanted to see. I wonder if it's that one. Um, and then she says, I think it's been in some sort of a horrible accident. And as soon as she said that, I may have squealed, may, um, because I knew what it was. Um, so there you go. The wrinkle-faced bat. Um, even I will look at this bat and say, he's pretty darn ugly. Um, but again, beautiful function. Okay, It's a fruit eater. 
And you can generally tell fruit eaters they have great big canines. Um, so their, their vampire teeth are huge. When you first look at them, you often think, man, this thing must like eat humans or something. Those canines are so huge. But then you look at the back, back teeth, and all of the back teeth are low and flat and rounded. And that's what the fruit eaters have. Okay, so it's a fruit eater. Most of the fruit eaters eat little fruits. Um, so they'll hover in front of them, grab them with those great, great big canines, pop them off, carry them somewhere, and eat them. Um, this guy doesn't do that. Um, what it does is it grabs big fruits, hugs them, and just starts chewing. Okay? And a good chunk of its energy comes from fruit juice. Uh huh. If you've got hair all over your face, all the fruit juice is just going to get stuck there. Um, you're not going to be able to get that fruit juice, and it now may attract bacteria because you've got sugar all over your face. Okay? Another researcher figured out, huh, I wonder, all those little wrinkles and folds, I wonder, they took a dropper with colored fluid, they put drops of fluid on the bat's face. No matter where they put the drops of fluid, it flowed right to the mouth. Okay? So all the wrinkles do make sense if you understand how they're feeding. By the way, one of the other things I love about them is it's got this big collar. That's really loose skin there. Um, you can actually pull it out and pull it. This is a fairly small bat, but you can pull it out quite a ways. They live in the tropics. They roost during the day, normally in dead trees, um, especially hollow trees is where they like to roost. But the tropics are notorious for having lots of mosquitoes. So if you've got a naked face, um, the mosquitoes are just going to love you. So you, they can pull that collar up and, and cover their entire head when they're, when they're asleep to try and keep the mosquitoes off of them. So are they ugly? Yeah, maybe, but, but super, super cool biology. OK, now, um, so how do we catch bats? And the first answer to that, and kind of the smart aleck answer to that, is pretty poorly, actually. Um, bats are really hard to catch. And the thought is that for every 10 bats that fly by, we probably only catch one of those or so. And the other thing, and actually what's even a bigger problem, is that we catch different kinds of bats at different rates. So using this, these things, what are called mist nets, to try and measure the bat community, it works, but you have to realize that, okay, big brown bats are really easy to catch, um, whereas the small, agile bats are much harder to catch. So, so we're not catching them in equal numbers. You always have to kind of keep that in mind. But basically, here you can see what the net looks like. And it's really fine, and it's designed so that the bats can't see it with their eyes. Bats, contrary to popular belief, do have pretty good eyesight. Um, their nighttime eyesight is probably a bit better than ours is. Um, but their echolocation, of course, is mind-boggling, right? They can find things about the, the diameter of a human hair with their echolocation. When they're heavily echolocating, we don't stand much of a chance. You'll turn on your light and look, and you'll see a bat just doing loops in front of the net, and you know you're sunk, because he's figured out the net is there, and you're not going to catch him. Um, what you're hoping is that they fly along, and they do spend quite a bit of time flying along just by memory. So think about this for a second. It's 2 in the morning. You've got to go to the bathroom. Do you turn on all the lights? No, you basically know how to get to the bathroom, right? You've got it memorized. They memorize a lot of the trails that they follow regularly. So they'll just fly along with just an occasional chirp every 10 seconds or so just to, to see if there's big obstacles out in front of them. Um, when they're doing that, you'll catch them. And you'll be sitting there, and you'll have a light on looking at the net, and you've got a bat detector running, and you'll just see this bat come screaming along. You don't hear a thing on your bat detector. It just plows right into the net. So you know he's flying along without echolocation. The other thing that bats do is they chase each other a lot. When you're out at night, listen for this. You'll hear them chattering at each other as they, as they chase each other. When they chase each other, they're not really paying that much attention. Um, my guess is it's often males chasing females, um, and, and so then you catch them um, when, they're not, when they're not really paying that close of attention. The places that we use, the upper left-hand corner there really gives you a good sense for the places where we set nets. We look for woods. All of our local bats are, are woods, are, are forest animals. Then we look for corridors through the woods. Um, trails, ATV trails, um, uh, footpaths, but stream beds are really the best. Then we look for a spot where tree branches arch out from both sides. That forces the bats down low. Um, and it also now creates a bunch of clutter. And so you tuck your nets right underneath all of the, the clutter that's hanging down, and then you cross your fingers. Um, and literally, in a typical night, we'll put up somewhere between five and 10 nets and one or two of those nets will catch bats, and the other ones don't. Um, to our eyes, they all look the same. I don't know why this one catches more than that one, um, but it just is, a, is the way it happens. So you have to put up a whole bunch of nets and then just cross your fingers. Um, 
The, the nets are seven feet tall. Each net is seven feet tall, but you can stack them on top of each other. So that picture in the lower left is, is our big net system um, that allows you to stack three nets on top of each other, and then you put a fourth net independent down below that. So that allows you to get up to about 34 feet in, in height. Okay? And the nets range anywhere from about 18 feet long. You can actually buy and custom buy them smaller than that. Um, up to, uh, to about 120, 150 feet long. The longest ones we ever use are, are about 60 feet long. Uh, every once in a while, though, you don't want to use mist nets. Um, if you know there's going to be a bunch of bats coming out of a small place, you don't want to mist net up there because you'll end up with 60 or 70 bats in the net, and that's not much fun. Um, so what you do is you use a harp trap instead. Um, so this is called a harp trap. This is just a metal frame that goes around. We've tarped all around it so that the bats can't sneak around the edges. Um, and then in between the top and the bottom frame, there's just fishing line that runs up and down. But there's two sets of fishing line. Um, so there's one set and then about a four inch gap and then another set. And what the bats do is they'll fly around inside the barn. Um, they'll check this out a couple of times with their echolocation. Um, and then they just get this idea, I can make it. Um, so they start heading towards the, the net. And then this is crazy to watch because what they're doing is they're coming at the net like this or at the, at the harp trap. And then they go like this and go through the, through the slats. But the trick is, the next set of fishing line, we've offset. So now they get in the middle and just tuk, 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 back and forth and then tumble down into the bag. And then the bag is so slippery that they can't get out. So if you get lucky and get your harp trap in the right spot, you'll, you'll catch 50, 100 bats in, in just about no time. <laughs> OK, so there's how we catch, how we catch bats. Um, by the way, they do have um, quite a few different options for recording bats, the, recording their echolocation calls. And in many cases, you can identify a bat right down to species based on what, it's, what it sounds like. Um, and those are great, great uh, tools, and lots of researchers use those. Um, I tend towards the other kinds of questions, the questions that actually force you to have a bat in your hand. Are they breeding? What time of year are they breeding? How many babies do they have? What are their measurements? Um, those kinds of things. I want to put radio tags on them to be able to follow them um, wherever they're roosting. So those kinds of things that require you to actually catch a bat and have it in your hands. OK, now we'll just do this fast. Um, here's kind of a quick spin through of some of our bats. I'm not going to show you all nine. Um, I'm just going to show you a handful of them. How many of you have seen bats in buildings? Raise your hand, in buildings specifically. OK, you've seen this guy. Um, big brown bats are, in the Midwest, the most common bat in houses. Occasionally, you find houses that have little brown bats, but almost always they're big brown bats. Now, as it turns out, big brown bats are still pretty small. Um, so people always assume they have little brown bats because it's kind of small, but big brown bats are actually kind of small too. Um, so big browns are the super common ones in, in houses. They're basically the robins of the bat world. Um, they live in every conceivable habitat. They're super common. Um, and they're probably, in fact, more common today than they ever have been at any point in the past. They've figured out how to live with us. Um, and so we're basically creating habitat for them. Barns, bridges, churches, schools, houses, that's bat habitat, man. Um, it's just, it's just kind of your fault that you chose to build something that's bat habitat. So there you go. Um, this is a billion dollar bat. Um, this eats so many agricultural pests um, that the guess is that this bat alone is probably worth about a, a billion dollars in increased yields and decreased needs for, for pesticides use. Um, so, so a pretty important bat to have around. Okay, um, little brown bat. These guys can be common, but they're really patchy. Um, and the further north you go, the less patchy they become and the more abundant they become. Um, also super common near water. Um, so we have to be careful with this. Um, there's been a couple of times where we've strung up nets in northern Iowa over rivers. Um, you keep going, you set up another net, set up another net, set up another net, and then you come back and you're like, oh no, there's already 50 big little brown bats in, in our net. Um, remember that night? Yeah, we, had, we, we did a, a, a talk for a county conservation board. We set up a net. Came back to it like a half hour later, our first check of the night, and there was like 60 little brown bats in the net. Um, just, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the rear when that happens. Um, but now we're smarter. Um, but you can also see this is how bats love to roost. I had a, young, a, a woman at the end of the last talk, the talk that uh, was at four this afternoon, ask me, why is it that bats like these narrow little spaces? And, and I think basically the answer to that is most bats in a natural setting will roost in in dead trees that have the bark peeling off. So there's a little gap in between the, the bark and the wood. So that's what this represents. Or they love rocky crevices. 
a little narrow crevice in a rock where you can crawl back in um, two, three feet, and the snakes and the raccoons can't get in there after you. Um, so I think that's why they like those little narrow spaces. They're pretty safe places you can get back in there, and, and most of the predators can't get to you. Um, it also always amazes me numbers. Um, this was a, a barn just about four years ago, um, and there was a couple of different places. These are boards, and the boards are hanging straight down towards me, so I'm holding my camera and shooting straight up. Um, and there was a couple of spots that looked like this. And we guesstimated, you know, probably 50 little brown bats in there. Um, we strung up a, a couple of nets, kind of put them further back because we didn't want to get the whole mob all in a single shot. But then we also sat there and we counted. And we watched like 250 bats come out of that barn. So yeah, it always amazes me. They just cram, and they're like three, four deep, and they're sitting on top of each other. And how they all breathe, I don't know, but, but they don't seem to mind that. Um, but little brown bats are, are also one of the bats that is declining the fastest. What does WNS stand for? White nose syndrome. We'll talk a little bit about white nose syndrome here in a couple minutes. Okay, one of my best buddies, I love Indiana bats. Um, this is the little federally endangered species that we have. Um, mostly south of I-80. There's a couple of spots where we've caught them north of I-80, but mostly south of I-80. Um, they hibernate in caves. Um, caves and, and a one mine, at least one mine, down in Missouri and Arkansas. So they actually um, migrate away from here in the winter, um, go down to those caves and hibernate down there. Um, we're not 100% sure why this guy declined. It declined a whole bunch, like 90%. Then it stabilized for a little while, and now it's kind of gradually declining again. Um, it's not habitat. Um, a lot of times animals are declining because their habitat is being destroyed. These guys are kind of weedy. I mean, they, they, they grow in a whole bunch of different places. They live in a whole bunch of different places. Aren't, aren't super specific. The thought is it's probably pesticide exposure. Um, but, but even that, pesticide exposure is kind of notoriously hard to study out in the, in the wild. Um, so we're just not 100% sure why they're declining, but definitely are. Um, so we've done a, done a lot of work on these guys. Um, this is one of the ones that we do some radio telemetry with. So the little radio tag there, um, each radio tag is about 220 bucks or so. Um, you use a little bit of surgical glue. So you use a pair of some of those kind of curved surgical scissors and just snip a little bit of hair between the shoulder blades, then put on a glob of surgical glue, and then put the radio tag on, and then you just have to sit there and hold the bat for five minutes um, while the surgical glue um, binds. Um, the trick is to hold the bat tight enough that the, the glue binds but not suffocate it. Um, a couple of times I've thought, uh-oh, CPR, CPR. Um, I, haven't, I haven't killed one, but I came pretty close to it once. Um, but then you can now follow them and figure out, okay, where are they feeding? Where are they roosting during the day? Um, all those kinds of cool little tidbits. And then we also stick radio or uh, stick uh, wing bands on them. Um, these are provided to us by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I occasionally will catch my own bats, and so that's really useful. Oh, I caught this girl three years ago. Um, and, and most of who we catch are females. They, I don't know if they're literally more common or if they're just easier to catch. They may be flying down lower than males. Males may be flying up above the canopy. Um, and that's kind of my guess, that males are generally up higher, and so we don't catch quite as many of them. Um, but it's also really cool because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will go into these big mines and important caves down in Missouri and do surveys um, about every other winter to see what are the winter populations doing. And every year they'll call me or email me and say, okay, who is band number 212? Where did you catch her? Um, so they're finding my bats down there in the, you notice they're, they're my bats, um, but they're, they're finding the bats down there in, as they hibernate. So that's super cool when you can learn those kinds of uh, pieces of information about, about bats. Another one of my absolute favorites, this dude, northern long-eared bat, another little guy. Um, all of our local bats are insect eaters. This is the only one that adds a little bit something extra to it, and that something extra is spiders. Um, so they're super maneuverable. They'll hover in front of a spider's web, use echolocation to find the poor little helpless spider, and then pull it out of there. Um, well, about every 10, one out of every 10 or so northern long-eareds that we catch actually have spider webs somewhere on them. So they're doing this pretty regularly. Um, this guy is also was just recently listed as a federally threatened species. It was listed about four years ago. And that, again, is, is this white nose syndrome thing that's, that's happening. Okay, now, quick question for you. You are a landowner. Um, one day you look out your back window and you notice, uh-oh, that big old oak back in there died. What do you do? This is actually in a county park, okay? This particular tree um, was fairly close to a trail. 
Okay, notice that now creates some other problems. Is it potentially a, a risk? Okay, we actually had a, a conversation with the folks who run this park because the night before we had caught about seven northern long-eared bats. Um, but we tagged all of them with radio tags, and I was pretty excited. Okay, we're going to find a whole bunch of roost trees. Nope, all seven of them in that tree right there. Okay, um, so here is, whoops, just a second here, I went the wrong way. Here's a close-up of it. So this is now laying underneath it and looking up, and look how there's still peeling bark right there. That's where the bats are, is underneath that peeling bark. We would lay here um, right at sunset and watch bats drop out of there and fly away. Um, if, you get, if you get the position right, um, you can get the, sun, the fading sun coming in, and you just see these little bats drop out of there, and they're completely silent. Um, but it's also really cool because we usually have our radio transmitter, our radio receiver sitting right there. So you'll watch a bat go. And then you'll hear all of a sudden the, the, the sound that the radio receiver makes changes. So you know, whoop, there went our bat. Um, so it's cool, you write down, you know, when, when bat such and such left. Um, but it's, that is, that's amazing. That's a, a really cool feeling. We caught this bat last night. We learned a bit when we caught it. Um, now we put a tag on it. Now we're seeing literally where it's roosting. Um, you can then go out and, and try and figure out, okay, it's now three hours later. Where is it? Oh, man, it's a mile and a half over there. Um, so the, when you start to get those kinds of details and start to really know an organism like that, that's what makes this job so much fun. But we do have to talk a lot with the parks folks because I understand that sometimes trees have to come down because they are health risks. Um, but the key is don't take them down during bat breeding season. Okay? Um, Take them down during the middle of winter because there's not going to be a bat up there. Um, and then if they're far enough away from a trail, don't take them down. Some people just think that standing dead trees are ugly, but if you understand how important they are, you won't take them down. They're really, really important things. Eastern red bat, another very common little local bat. This is one you'll find right in cities. Um, they roost out in the leaves of trees. Um, so watch. In summer, you'll see bats flying right at sunset. Sometimes they're flying early enough that you can actually tell, that guy's orange. So you can literally identify um, uh, eastern red bats. Males are much brighter um, orangey. Females are more kind of a chestnut brown. They're both gorgeous bats, though. Uh, but notice one of the interesting aspects of this guy. He's got hair all over the tail membrane, and he's got hair extending way out onto the wings. Since this guy roosts out in the leaves of trees, it's exposed to cold temperatures spring and fall. Okay, so they have lots of hair. Look at the length of the ears. Okay, if you're out exposed to freezing temperatures because you're hanging out in a tree in the middle of October or the middle of April, um, you're going to lose the tips of your ears if they're really long. So they have shorter ears and they can actually tuck the ears down into the hair. Um, so they've got a number of these design features that are really telling you they're designed for, for cold weather. Okay, then here is the, the biggest bat in Iowa. So this is the hoary bat. And notice that's H-O-A, not W-H-O. Um, so hoary in this sense just means frosted. So it's telling you about the, the coloration. Okay, um, this is a, a high flyer. We catch very few of them, but I don't think, it's, I don't think they're actually that uncommon. Um, I think it's because they fly so high that they don't come down at the level of our nets a lot. But this is a bat that we know is declining and declining pretty fast. Um, they get hammered by the wind turbines. Nobody knows 100% why, but they, it appears that they are attracted to the wind turbines for one reason or another. Um, there's a couple of species that are like that, and, and they face pretty high rates of mortality. There's some research that suggests there are ways to, to get around this. So I think there's a fix here, but we need to figure it out fast. Because a, a recent um, paper came out that did some mathematical modeling saying that at the rates of mortality now, we actually may lose this bat um, within the next 50 to 100 years or so if we don't do some work on that. Okay, a little bit on white nose fungus. Um, so this is, it's a fairly recent fungus. It is not native to the United States. It's a European fungus. It was accidentally brought here. Um, it first arrived probably 2005 and then was discovered in 2006. Um, it hits the bats when they're hibernating in either caves or mines. And then what it does is it basically irritates them. It invades the skin, it itches them, um, and that wakes them up. If you wake a bat up enough times during hibernation, they burn off their fuel and they can't live till the end of hibernation. Um, so this is causing really big mortality rates. Um, this particular photo actually was taken um, down near Burlington, Iowa. I took the picture in January 2015, and that was when we first found um, white nose, um, the actual fungus here in, in Iowa. So it's here. So far, I'm not really seeing any signs that we're seeing massive rates of mortality here in Iowa, um, but it usually takes a couple of years for it to kick in, so we may still see it. Um, some of the species that are really hammered are listed there, so little browns and northern long-eareds and, and tricolored bats are the ones that really get hurt by it. Um, 
Still lots of unknowns. We don't exactly know what the overall impacts are going to be. Um, but we're seeing mortality rates of, of in excess of 90% in, in a lot of the places in the Northeast. Um, that 7 million bat number, um, that was from like three, four years ago. So, so we know that it's killed a whole bunch of bats. Some of the bats, the biggest bat that it's killing um, in terms of numbers are little brown bats. Little brown bats were literally the most abundant bat in most of the eastern um, U.S. Um, not only the most abundant bat, but the most abundant mammal. Um, and so now you're reducing them by 90, 95%. So what's that going to do to the insect populations? And then how's that going to ripple out and impact the entire ecosystem? Um, we're kind of just working with an experiment right now and seeing how this is all going to work out. <coughs> Say it again. So this, where, oh, this photo, it's a whole pile of dead bats. And then, and then somebody, probably a raccoon or somebody who's come in and nibbled on them. That's why you're seeing some signs of, of blood there. But yeah, it's unfortunate it's a pile of dead bats. Okay, and then this is just a map showing you the, the current extent. This is the, the most recent map um, showing you. The, they'll, they'll come up with another map here in just a couple of weeks that shows what has happened over the winter of 2018 and 19. But this is the, the latest one showing you that, yeah, roughly the eastern half of the, of the United States has been impacted um, by white-nosed fungus. So we've got this problem of invasive species, things coming in from other countries. Um, our critters are also spreading to other countries, so this goes all directions. We, we have to do a much better job of controlling the, the movement of species from one country to the next, because nightmares like this happen pretty commonly. Okay, I'm going to fly through this real fast. I only have like five minutes left. Um, just a little tiny bit on some of the research that we've done. Um, so we did a project a couple of years ago looking at barns um, and trying to figure out how often are barns used. And in particular, what we are really looking at for Indiana bats, keep in mind federally endangered species, there's a church in Pennsylvania and a barn in southeastern Iowa that unfortunately later collapsed. But both of those had three, 400 female bats and their babies. They were literally feeding the entire two or three counties surrounding with, with bats. So we wanted to know, is this happening a lot? Because if this is happening a lot, we can go in and we can protect some of those really important barns and we can really help the, the Indiana bats. So that was the idea here. But then we also wanted to know, you know, there's some little hints here and there that other species use barns, um, but nobody's ever really done a big scale survey. And on top of that, barns are disappearing fast and they're being replaced by these, these completely soulless metal Morton sheds and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was the, the gist here. So, we went into a whole bunch of barns during the day and looked for bat poop. Um, by the way, um, if you pay me enough money, I can show you how to take a piece of bat poop, put it in the middle of your hand, smear it, and then you can identify what species of bat it came from. But that's going to cost you. That's going to cost you. <laughs> the, the barns that actually showed lots of signs of poop, we'd go back at night and we'd net them. Um, so here's what we found. First of all, the majority of barns, we looked at 233 barns over a couple of years. Um, almost 80% of those had, had good signs of, of bats in them. Um, here's that same picture again of the little brown bats crammed in there. Um, and then the, over the two years, we netted 47 barns. We caught a total of almost 1,500 bats, but notice who they were. Big brown bats, little brown bats, and how about Indiana bats? You know, we did catch a few, but, but apparently big, uh, Indiana's, apparently that barn in southeastern Iowa is kind of a fluke, um, and now it's gone. But, um, but so, so unfortunately, we were a bit disappointed that we didn't catch more Indianas, but sometime in research, what you find is just what you find. Um, and so what we found here then was that barns are really important for big brown and little brown bats. Um, both of them are super common in there. Both of these guys eat lots of, of agricultural pests, so it's a great place to have them. Um, but Indiana bats, unfortunately, aren't really using barns um, as much as we thought. We also did a bunch of radio telemetry in that area, just as kind of a second way of analyzing this. So we wanted to know, okay, well, where are the Indiana bats roosting? So we'd go into the woods around the barns, catch the Indiana bats, slap radio tags on them, and this is where they're roosting. They're roosting in the trees, um, which is pretty much what the literature tells us that they're doing. So, so all of our Indianas were roosting in trees. This one right here we called the swamp tree. Um, that's Curtis. You can't really tell, but Curtis is in about knee-deep water. Um, and Curtis is probably, uh, um, probably eating mosquitoes as this picture is being taken. Um, and, uh, but that, that tree right there had about 80 or so Indiana bats in it. Um, right here, see that little thingy? That looked familiar to you? That's the antenna. Um, so this is a, a little Indiana that was roosting in a, in a shag bar kickery, and we could actually see its, its antenna sticking out there. Okay, then real fast on another project, and this isn't really something I intended to do. But we've done so much netting in the state, um, 
And we've been noticing ever since we started that, hey, we're, we're finding bats in places that we didn't know. Um, the scientific literature doesn't even tell us that the bats are here. So we're learning a lot about their geographic distributions. We're learning a lot about when they do certain things. Um, and so, so we decided to turn this into a paper. And this is, we're going to submit this here in just about a month. Um, and so from 2002 to 2018, um, a whole herd of college students and I, we did about 410 nights of mist netting, looked at a whole bunch of barns. Not surprisingly, caught a lot of bats, caught about 6,000 bats or so. Um, and we've got about 142 new county records. Um, and then we've also learned a whole lot. I'm going to skip that. Um, we learned a whole lot about reproduction. This is kind of a cool, a cool figure. The, the open circles are records that were previously known. So records that previous researchers had recorded. So for the big brown bat, the most common bat in the state, we pretty much already knew. If you look across there, there's, there's open circles everywhere. We pretty much knew already that they were living across the state. The filled in sp um, sp uh, dots and triangles, those are our records. So yeah, there's some county records here. So we got county records in Tama County and Franklin County, but we pretty much already knew they were there. Um, but look at the triangles. The triangles are reproductive records. Look at the open triangles. How many of them do you see? One. Nobody before has reported whether the bats they're catching are reproductively active or not. So we really didn't know. Yes, big brown bats are found all over the place, but maybe a lot of these were hibernating bats. Are they actually breeding across the state? The closed triangles, the dark triangles, those are ours. All right, so we, we now know that, in fact, they are breeding all the way across the state. Um, so we've, we've added a lot of information in terms of where things are breeding. And then, this is kind of one of my favorite favorite charts here. And don't even look. Um, I mean, it's just too much. But this is, what's the earliest time of year you ever caught big brown bats? What's the latest you've ever caught them? Um, when do you catch the earliest lactating female big brown bats? The latest um, lactating female. When do you catch uh, big brown bats that clearly are done lactating? So these are some of the important indicators that tell us when bats are reproducing. The bold-faced you see a lot of those dates are bold-faced. Those are our records. Um, and so we've been out and catching so many bats that we've essentially rewritten what we know of the timing of reproductive activity in, in bats. So this, to me, is probably the biggest single thing we've done. We've, we've really given us much better understanding of when bats are doing certain things um, throughout the year. OK, two slides. That one. Purdy bats. Um, every other year, I go down to Costa Rica. Um, if you're cool and you go where the cool kids go to college, Central College, um, you too can join me on a trip to, to Costa Rica, and we catch a lot of bats there. Um, so these are all bats from, from Costa Rica. Notice that two of them have these cool triangles of skin that stick up off the nose. See if you can figure out what, think about that. What is, what is the purpose of that? OK, then last slide. So I've had students who, quote unquote, help me during the summer. Um, and honestly, most of them never really do any work. I do all the work. They sit and they play cards, or they find the nearest hay handling equipment and they use it as slides. Um, again, I already told you, right? I knew my oldest daughter was coming, so I had to harass her. There she is. Here she is. I'm pretty sure she fell off that thing. <clears throat> okay, there you go. Let me go back to that slide. Okay, I am the guy in the lower left. Isn't that a gorgeous bat? Um, I, I don't even know its common name. A lot of the tropical bats don't have common names. Um, that's Phylostomus discolor is its, its scientific name. Um, but it's a big fruit eater. Um, so I'm, I'm that bat. I'm flying around. I've got a grape in my mouth. Um, I don't think they actually eat grapes, but I just figured a grape's good, good to visualize. I'm trying to echolocate. What's the problem I face? I've got a grape in my mouth. Okay. Hmm. If only I could shoot the sound out through my nose much like shooting milk out my nose when I laugh. You remember, you, many of you probably did that or you saw it. There is a connection. There's a connection to the back of your throat between your nose and your mouth. They make the sound with their vocal cords, just like I'm doing. But instead of shooting it out the mouth, they shoot it out through the nose. That thing lays forward in flight and acts like a bullhorn to concentrate the sound as it goes out in front. That's a, that's a specific family of bats. They're called the leaf-nosed bats. There's like 300 species. Super cool, um, mostly tropical dudes. OK, good. So come on up if you still have additional questions.